What's up and welcome to another live unboxing review with Gizmo Slip Tech. Today we've got the Asus ROG Ally, the latest handheld to be released just a couple of days ago and I have been putting this thing through its paces, fully testing it out on a variety of uh, resolutions, bunch of different games, um, I figured out a bunch of tips and tricks that I can't wait to share with you in this video. Um, we're gonna go through a setup guide on how to, how I set up my Asus ROG Ally. We're gonna go through all the little tips and tricks that I figured out as I have used the device. Um, we're gonna talk about maximizing your battery life on this thing. We're also going to be testing this at a variety of resolutions. So we're gonna go down to HD, which is 720p. We're gonna bump it up to full HD, 1080p. We're gonna do a couple of QHD, uh, gaming tests as well with an external monitor. And then we've got an ultra widescreen monitor right back here. We're also gonna try a few benchmark tests on the ultra wide monitor. And yes, it can actually play some games on the ultra wide monitor at 3840 by 1080p resolution, which is just freaking insane to me that a little handheld running on battery could even think about running ultra wide gaming at all. It can actually in some AAA games, decent frame rates and have a fairly enjoyable experience on that ultra wide monitor. So we're not gonna do a lot of testing on there, but we're just gonna, I'm just gonna showcase that it's possible. Though obviously many titles will not also run at that high of a resolution. So it's gonna be hit and miss depending on what you're doing. So we're also gonna talk about how you can upgrade your SSD in the Asus ROG Ally, as well as a micro SD card upgrade, what you should look for in your micro SD card. Um, and I do have a bunch of links in the description down below to the Asus ROG Ally, where I bought it. I bought this from Best Buy. This is not sponsored in any way by any companies, but if you do use the links down below, it does help support me as a content creator. So thank you very much if you do use those links uh, if you find this video helpful. I have links in the description to the various accessories that I'm gonna be using today, including the wireless keyboard, that's a gaming keyboard, uh, the wireless mouse, that's a gaming mouse, the Thunderbolt 4 dock, though this is only USB-C, so you can't fully utilize the Thunderbolt 4 port on this device uh, because you know, it doesn't have a Thunderbolt port because it's a Ryzen processor, but you can still utilize that Thunderbolt port. I don't think that the Razer Thunderbolt port is or dock is probably the best value dock out there for this because it is a rather expensive dock, relatively speaking, but it is the only one that I've been able to get working properly with the um, the RG Ally. Now I did buy a cheaper one off Amazon and had it shipped one day delivery just so I could try seeing if I can get a cheaper one to work, but the HDMI functionality was not working properly for outputting the video signal. So that was kind of a deal breaker, which made me lean back towards at least using the, the Razer Thunderbolt dock for this video. Now, if I find another dock that I think is very relevant or, or works well with the Ally, I will link in the description uh, when it's you know when it's time. Another big thing that uh, we're going to be talking about today is how does this thing stack up against a gaming laptop? Because you know many of my audience out there are all about gaming laptops, and so for someone who is a traditional gaming laptop user, is this something you could viably upgrade to if you have a really old gaming laptop, um, or is this more of a side grade thing? Uh, like you have this and a gaming laptop, or this and a gaming desktop, perhaps. Uh, we're going to talk about. I guess the most applicable users that are gonna be most interested in this. I think most of you already know that, but I'm gonna give you my thoughts on all of that as well. So without further ado, let's get into the unboxing and we'll just go through. So we got the Razer Thunderbolt dock, the Logitech keyboard, the wireless mouse, and these are a little bit expensive. We're also using the Mon Duo display or for basically putting out the, uh, the video out from the, the Ally for some of our testing today. Uh, for QHD and also just so it's easier for the camera to pick up the, the benchmark data and everything. But so this is the Razer dock. It's a Thunderbolt 4 with Chroma. It costs 329. You can also get obviously cheaper docks with USB-C. Uh, just know this is the one that we'll be using basically for today's video. The Logitech G915 is the keyboard that I'm using. I've you've been using this keyboard for a while now. The battery lasts a long time and it's been working really well for me. It is a little bit expensive, but it's also um, light speed as in very competitive in terms of being a wireless keyboard. Um, and I do use it on my couch sometimes uh, when I'm gaming, sitting, you know, hook my gaming laptop up to the TV and plug that in. I can use that for wireless gaming. Uh, the SteelSeries AirOx 3 is a light honeycomb wireless obstacle gaming mouse. 
$89, it's been working really well for me, but the battery life doesn't seem to last that long. So I don't know how much I can recommend this one. Um, I do have to plug it in every few days, otherwise the battery does run out. Now there is a few different SSDs you can get out there that are two terabyte, 2230 SSDs. And this is the kind of SSD size you're gonna need if you're gonna get an ROG Ally SSD upgrade. And this is definitely one of the better uh, SSDs that I think you can get. There are some other options. There's a little bit cheaper. Uh, like I know there was like a Micron SSD on Newegg that was I think $190. So it's a little bit cheaper than this one, but I do rock two Sabrent SSDs in my Blade 18 and I've been using them for a few years now and I've had no problems with those SSDs. Now I did buy this micro SD card slot, the Extreme Plus one terabyte micro SD card slot and our micro SD card. And I gotta say the performance has not been amazing for game loading. It it does work. And but it but I can tell that you know the, the transfer speeds on this card are not ideal. And I think ultimately uh, well, you certainly can use this one. You're gonna have to expect longer load times. It says up to 200 megabytes a second for read and write, but that is not sustained read and write speeds. That's on a burst. So like, for example, when you're downloading the games onto this card, it just took way longer than it takes to download onto the normal SSD. So just know that if you do go this route, instead of going say with the Sabrent, I would rec I would just highly recommend going with like the Sabrent two terabyte SSD because the the uh, speed in which you're gonna be able to play your games, load your games are gonna be just so much better um, of a user experience than if you just go with a micro SD card slot. Now the micro SD card slot is obviously a little more versatile because you can pop it in, pop it out without taking the, the ROG Ally apart. It's still not gonna be the same quality of experience. You might wanna focus on getting a higher sustained read and write speed uh, SD card. This is definitely one of the higher quality ones, but I'm pretty sure that there are some even higher quality micro SD card slots out there. So if you know any that you'd recommend, uh, please share them in chat or in the description down below. Looking primarily for sustained read write speeds that are you know closer to 100 megabytes. I'm pretty sure this goes down to like 40 megabits per second uh, when you're dealing with sustained, not a burst. So we're going to be using this Mon Duo um, display system to to uh, show off the dock. We're gonna dock to this monitor today. And then this was an alternative micro SD card slot that I was gonna potentially recommend the Samsung Pro. I'm not sure, I have not tested this, but it's rated at the same V30 speed. So hard to say if it's actually gonna be much faster, but this was very cheap at $42.99. Much, much more cost effective storage expansion than going with the one, uh, like a two terabyte SSD or the two ter uh, one terabyte micro SD. This might be the much more cost effective option for you. And there are of course links in the description down below to all of these if you want want to check them out. I recently did a matchup with a laptop versus a gaming laptop, right? Sorry, the Steam Deck versus a gaming laptop um, that are, are you know around the same price point. And the thing was, uh, a lot of the games are gonna be very CPU bound when you do benchmarks. Uh, at 720p or 1080p, um, just th these CPUs are not super high throughput for ultra high frame rate gaming. Um, and when people are doing a lot of their benchmarks with the Ally against the Steam Deck, I believe what's happening is there, you know, a lot of them are being very CPU bottlenecked in their benchmarks. And that has caused a lot of people to say that the Ally is only like 15 or 20, 30% faster than the Steam Deck, which may be true when you're talking 720p resolution and lower graphical settings. But when you are pumping this up to 1080p resolution or even higher, like we are gonna to do today, we're gonna to test it, like I said, on the ultra wide monitor um, for at least a couple of the games, you're gonna see that this thing has way more graphical throughput than the Steam Deck by more than 15%. So for people that are looking to play at higher resolutions, at least 1080p or higher, or uh, on external monitors in a dock scenario, the ROG Ally, I think is gonna be hands down a much better choice. It had two little plastic uh, stickers on here. I had to take those off or cut them apart. And then when we lift it up, you can see there's the ally right there. I did my best putting the plastic back on there, but it's not quite perfect. Um, overall, I really like the rigidity of the ROG ally itself. And like when you hold it in your hand, it feels 
I don't know. I, I think it feels just as premium as the Steam Deck, but at the same time, I like the way certain things feel on the Steam Deck a little bit better. Like I like the, um, I like that there's little touch pads on the Steam Deck, but also I like the simplicity of this. Like this is just your standard controller setup with a, two joysticks and one D-pad, X, A, B, Y uh, buttons here. You got your shoulder buttons and your trigger buttons on the top on both sides. And then of course you have rear buttons, buttons as well. You've got this holographic strip that I think looks really cool. I like that. And we also have uh, actual RGB circles around each of the joysticks. When we turn this thing on, um, I guess you'll see that once I re-enable the lighting because I actually turned it off because when I was playing games, the RGB lighting actually kind of gets in your face a bit and can be a little bit um, disruptive, I think, to your gameplay. Now, this does come with a 65 watt power adapter. You can see right there, it says 65 on it. And that is how powerful of a power adapter you're gonna want to deliver to the Ally through, if you're gonna get an external dock or whatever, because basically, if you're going to use the Ally in a dock scenario, you want it to be able to boost to the highest um, GPU clock, which requires at least 30 watts of continuous power delivery at a minimum. But I've seen the Ally boost up to 50 watts of power consumption, um, at least for short periods of time. Then it kind of comes down and maintains usually around 30. But I have seen it maintain closer to 40 sometimes. Just depends on the game and the scenario. Another thing that they include in the box, right here in the top, is a little stand. So this is just a very basic stand, but it lets you um, put the ROG Ally in a like set up position, which makes it easy to um, you know set it on a desk, uh, have vertically, or to now I'm going to use it so that I can now plug in the external monitor and keyboard and mouse and still be able to use the device if I wanted to. Um, but we are going to mainly be using the external monitor when we're actually looking at the the data and everything. Now, in terms of ports, uh, we have our power button. This is a fingerprint sensor. This is gonna let you log in with Windows Hello. It has not been working very well for me in my experience. It only works probably 50% of the time when I put my finger on there. And as far as I know, I'm putting my finger on there pretty dang well, and it's just not really picking it up very cleanly. We have our volume up and down. Um, and the only complaint I have about the volume uh, in general is that in Windows 11, it's a one to 100 volume levels. If you wanted to press this, you'd have to press it 50 times to get the volume to go all the way from minimum to maximum, or you have to hold it down and it takes a few seconds to go all the way from zero volume to 100 or vice versa. And I really wish there was a quick way to mute the volume um, or to quickly, more quickly with only like 10 taps to make the volume go all the way up and down. I do prefer that uh, if Windows were to change it, it'd be much better. Now, uh, to where it was like only 10, 10 intervals to go from zero volume to 100, that would be a better interface. Our, our actual um, power port is right here on this USB-C, but this is the XG mobile port. You can actually plug in the entire uh, external GPU interface right here on the XG mobile port and run an uh, eGPU uh, which is basically like a large, um, a large little box that sits next to um, the device. I can go ahead and pull this up real quick. So Best Buy does indeed have some for sale. They got the RTX 3080. I would not recommend this at $14.99. Um, maybe this 6850 XT1 799. That is probably a pretty good deal. Um, and it's gonna give you a lot of performance for the money. The best one obviously is gonna be the RTX 4090 variant, but that's probably gonna be about $1,500. But that would basically give you 4K high FPS gaming um, and much more future-proof um, in terms of overall FPS. Now the 6850 XT is also gonna give you awesome performance, like a high to mid-range gaming laptop, essentially, if you pair this ally with the 6850 XT. And of course, this uh, XG Mobile also doubles as an external dock with an HDMI and display port, networking port, and four USB A's out. So you can easily hook up your keyboard, mouse, monitor, um, internet, all of that, and it all plugs into one slot here on the Ally. All of that just plugs right into here. So if you have the money, 
obviously that is going to be the way to go um, rather than getting like something like the Razer Thunderbolt dock, which is not, like I said, not my ideal recommendation because this doesn't even have a Thunderbolt port on it. Um, and you can definitely get cheaper alternative docks if you're, you know, trying to save money. So here's the SD card slot. And like I said, I have the um, Extreme SanDisk Extreme Plus in here just for today. I'm probably going to return this uh, SD card just because um, I'm I've, I, I have ordered a two terabyte SSD upgrade that's coming in the mail, uh, but it's not here yet. And I'm gonna take this apart and show you how you can upgrade your SSD on this uh, ROG Alley. And I've not actually taken it apart, so it'll be fun uh, trying that out. Now we have a uh, headphone headset adapter port here as well. So you can do audio in and out right through that one port. Now I did use my AirPods uh, with the ROG Ally when I took the Ally to the gym and I had no problems using my AirPods for several hours in a row with the Ally and I really enjoyed using this Ally at the gym. Like I was just sitting there on the elliptical playing The Witcher 3 for like an hour and it was awesome. Now, so we have our Windows home screen here. Uh, if you wanna go, if you swipe up, it, so it did not use my fingerprint when I enabled it. So let me see if it'll go this time. It's still not working. Now it's requiring my pin. So I have to tap in here and I'll just go ahead and type it in. So now we're in to uh, Windows. And uh, overall, I think the ROG Ally software is in a decent spot. I think that the biggest issue I've had with it is there's been so many little updates and there's been multiple BIOS updates that it had to go through, um, different tweaks here and there that I'm having to constantly do as I try different games. But once you have all your settings set up exactly how you want them, it's pretty easy. So uh, let's go ahead and start going through all of the different settings that I've got set up on my ROG Ally to basically maximize performance or maximize battery life, where all of those settings are so that you as a user understand the device uh, a bit better. And we can then move into the benchmarks. So the key buttons here on the interface is on the left, we have our D-pad, joystick, and then we have basically on the left here, this will get you into whatever menu uh, of whatever game you're in. So if you want to basically the equivalent of the escape key in like The Witcher 3, you press this button. Uh, you press this button to pull up your ROG options. So these are your quick options. If you want to change your performance mode, your screen brightness going up and down, um, you can change auto mode. This is very important. The auto mode here is going to let you easily switch into controlling your mouse or in you need to be in game or switch to gamepad mode basically so if you're in you see right now it says gamepad mode you're not going to be able to move the mouse with your joystick i'm in gamepad mode i cannot move the mouse with my joystick if i click this again it switches to desktop mode right here now i can move my mouse on windows okay and if i want to click on windows I use the right bumper button, not the trigger, but the bumper, okay? So that is how you click in Windows. And it works pretty well, I'm not gonna lie. It works pretty well. If you want to right click, you hold the trigger down and there's your right click. You tap the right, tap the right trigger and you can right click in Windows. So your left and right click is handled with the bumper and the right trigger. Um, and then this of course controls your mouse. And it's very important what mode you're in when you launch your games. If you are in the incorrect mode, uh, for example, when I loaded in uh, Call of Duty Warzone 2, if I was in desktop mode where it, this was controlling the mouse, it did not detect that I had, I had a controller attached to the system and I could not control Warzone inside of the game when I was in desktop mode. And even when I switched it to gamepad mode, it still did not detect the controller. So uh, when you go to launch your games, you need to launch the game in the correct mode. And one of the ways to do that is by setting up your game profiles. Now I just click this button and that's supposed to launch Armory Crate, which it's not currently launching. Maybe I need to click it again. Try to get the exposure right here. Okay, there we go. So 
Uh, you can see all the different games that I've got installed, and we're gonna try to test these out. But so basically, you go to whatever game profile if you want to if you want to manage your performance modes, all of that based on each game. Then what you need to do is go to the game. You press A, and here you can select whether you want to launch in gamepad mode, keyboard mouse mapping, desktop mode, and you can also uh, use a when you create the profile for a new game that you've not loaded before, you can choose to copy an existing profile from another game. So the very first game that you run, you might wanna set this up and then just use that to copy uh, your profile for whatever new games that you start running on the system. Um, and this is of course, if you're gonna use the Armory Crate as your launching tool for controlling your ROG Ally. You don't have to, you could use Steam Beam, uh, Steam Big Picture, or you could just launch everything through the Windows, Windows interface like a normal laptop as well. So you don't have to, but just know that like, if you have these game profiles set up incorrectly, the ROG Ally is going to uh, use the Armory Crate software to launch whatever profile is set up, even if you launch it in Windows, right? So if you have the profile set up wrong here in Ally, uh, sorry, in the Armory Crate, and you go to launch inside the Steam Launcher, The Witcher 3, but it's set to be default in desktop mode instead of gamepad mode, it can cause some problems. So you just wanna make sure that your profiles inside of Armory Crate are set up correctly, unless you're planning on just removing Armory Crate, um, though I don't think I would recommend doing that. Uh, but if you wanted to change uh, this, right? You have a customized game profile for this game. Do you wanna to switch to auto mode to play this game with the profile enabled? You could hit yes, or you can hit no. Um, so, and you can also hit do not show again if you just wanted to always load with the game profile enabled. So I'm just gonna back out for a second. Looks like I accidentally launched the game anyway. So notice that it said I'm currently in desktop mode, which is, is not good. We wanna be in gamepad mode if we're launching into a game. Yeah, that's like a, an example of like, usually I think you're gonna wanna be typically in auto mode. So that way, when you're in a desktop type environment, it'll switch to the cursor automatically for you. Yeah, so auto mode sometimes still doesn't work flawlessly, you know? So that's part of the dilemma with this being a fully Windows 11 based handheld. You know, when you're talking about the Steam Deck, the Steam Deck's running like Steam OS, in a Linux-based thing that's completely designed for handheld interfaces. When you're dealing with a full Windows thing where you have like overlays kind of overlapping windows, there's a lot more complex software issues that need to be solved in that type of scenario. And that's where the Ally both shines in strength and also really has a lot of weaknesses in terms of how the software is integrated because if Armory Crate is being a little buggy or you didn't customize Armory Crate properly, it can cause games to load improperly and then you have to restart the game and reload it and all of that. And it's not uh, the ideal, perfectly working out of the box scenario. And of course, the other issue is that since this is a fully Windows 11 device, you're gonna need to go through and set up and customize your game settings for each game, typically. Um, now, as the Ally software matures, there may be uh, new presets that developers utilize for Ally um, devices to just be preset and launch at certain resolutions and settings out of the box and be more of an out of the box type of experience as we go on. But right now, it's still pretty early in the software and uh, the, not very many developers have optimized for the ROG Ally. If you want to get into the Windows start menu, you saw that I just swiped up right there in the middle of the screen. That gives you the Windows start menu. Now, if you swipe over from the right side, you can get the Windows notifications menu. If you swipe up from the bottom right, you can get all of your Windows controls, including your speakers. So you can quickly turn your volume up and down here or adjust your brightness on the display. And I gotta say this display is quite nice. I do enjoy this display. We've got an interesting thing going on with all of these, all of this, these icons appearing and disappearing. I think it's cause there's not enough space down here. So it's like going to the second layer of icons or something. Um, you also have your Windows kind of info dash thing over here. This has like the weather and other stuff here. Now there are, I do wanna mention uh, the, this is gonna be an excellent device for cloud gaming. Um, so cloud game streaming with Xbox Game Pass, GeForce Now, uh, you have the PlayStation streaming service. I think it's like PlayStation Plus or something like that. Basically that's gonna let you play ultra high resolution gaming and not consume very much battery life on here when you're at home and you're gonna get 
Uh, as long as you have good internet and a good connection speed to your router, it's a really good experience. I did play some Halo Infinity on here and it was awesome. I was gonna try to test that today if we have time as well. While we're here, I'd like to go ahead and just note that we are in turbo operating mode. So if you are in, if you're just generally in Windows, you can, you don't have to worry about being in high performance mode. You can be in silent mode and save battery life. Typically, if you're wanting high performance uh, gaming, you're probably gonna wanna be in performance mode. Now, performance mode is supposed to use 15 watts of power. I've seen it use 15 to 20 watts of power in that range. And the performance is pretty good. Like, for example, in The Witcher 3, in silent mode, I was maybe getting 25 FPS, barely playable, kinda. Performance mode, I was getting like 40. And in turbo mode, and you're at 1080p with high settings, I was getting like 60 to 70 FPS in The Witcher 3, which was amazing. That's what I was playing as, is turbo mode. Turbo mode is really where you wanna be, or in manual mode, which I will show you how to set up here in a moment. Now, there is real-time monitoring. This is gonna let you do um, some cool things. Let me just go ahead and see if I can get. Right here, you can see the real-time monitoring. It lets you check your CPU usage, GPU usage, the APU wattage usage, and then your overall system usage right there at the very bottom saying 10.1 watts. It also lets you see your battery level at 91%. You can always grab this and move this around wherever you need to put it on the screen so it's kind of out of the way. And then you can always activate it and deactivate it with a quick touch right here. Now there is FPS limiters um, that you can turn on right here in the software if you don't wanna mess with the, the game, if you wanna limit to 30 frames per second to increase battery life, you can just tap this and set it to 15, 30, 45, 60, or off. Uh, and in, of course, in games, you can also enable that. Like uh, within most game settings, you can set the FPS limit if you want to be more conservative on your juice. This keyboard button is very important. I have found that many of the games, uh, when the game menu is not popping up the way you need it to, um, or you're needing to map a key that's an awkward key, and you're not hooked up to an external keyboard like we will be here, like the keyboard right here behind us, um, and you need to pop open the keyboard, there's the key button here. Now, there are a lot of different keyboard options that you can use on the ROG Ally. Right now I have it set up so that it's basically designed for thumb typing, which is the left and right split setup. But you can also set it to be, let's see here, if I go to keyboard layout, I can go to the default keyboard. This is like larger keys, but a lot of the special keys like the escape button is not shown here. And I find I found that in a lot of the games when I'm trying to get to the certain settings or something, I couldn't get the right setting to appear or something. I needed to pop open the keyboard and press a Windows key. So in order to access that, I changed it to traditional keyboard layout where you have the escape button and all of the little normal keys that you might need to press. Um, so this is kind of a little trick that I've been using to just navigate uh, this kind of awkward software interface where you have a full Windows 11 but you don't have a physical keyboard and you need to always be able to pop this open at a quick like tap, tap, and boom, there it is. Um, so very important to, to know that that's there. Um, there's also a record screen option, which I had to enable this in Armory Crate. Uh, I have not tested this much. Uh, you have AMD RSR, you can turn on and off right here. Um, and that's pretty much the primary things here. I mean, you have your game profiles. This should open up our Armory Crate. So, um, Inside of Armory Crate, you have your gamepad mode and your desktop mode. We were talking about this. We've been talking about this mode quite a bit. You need to know what you're in. Uh, if you're in gamepad mode, that basically means you're trying to control a game environment with your, you know, aiming your camera, usually with your right thumbstick, moving your legs with the left thumbstick. Um, and of course, these buttons, the shoulder button and trigger button are not your mouse clicks anymore when you're in gamepad mode. They are whatever those buttons are mapped to for gameplay. Now, if you want to customize, your buttons, you can actually customize them. And I notice notice that the um, the rear buttons are usually not mapped, I noticed, uh, by default, but I actually map them to nine and zero, which are my benchmarking keys, so that when we're playing games, I can actually capture benchmark data with those buttons. But yeah, you can map those to whatever else um, in-game functionality that you wanted. Um, and then you can, of course, in the, the game settings, map the key to like the nine key or the zero key or whatever key it is. Um, for the game you're playing, and you can set that up, uh, which is, it's cool. I love that this is integrated right into the software. 
Uh, you also have desktop mode. This is the layout for the left click, right click. And if you wanted to additional key buttons, like you wanted one button to open the Windows button or the notification center or do some kind of macro or something, you can set some of that up here. Um, this is the home page for the Armory Crate application. So you can navigate your game library and I have installed all of these games on the local system, but about uh, a little over half of the games are on the micro SD card slot. And you'll see today the difference when you load a game that's on the SSD, it's much faster than when you're loading a game on the micro SD card slot. So um, that's something that's very important to keep in mind. Um, when you're loading like complicated AAA titles and you're running it off of the micro SD card slot, it's gonna run slower and have longer loading times is the, the biggest difference in my opinion. We're gonna go down to operating mode and this is something that's just like the laptops essentially. And you, in here you have your Windows. If you select the Windows option, that is going to match whatever profile your Windows is currently mapped to. I wouldn't use this. I would say to either use, um, typically, unless you're playing a really light game, silent mode is only really gonna be for like web browsing or like watching Netflix or something really lightweight. Most games are gonna really need performance mode to be able to play really, really well. Unless you're playing like a 2D side-scrolling adventure type game or you're okay with only getting 30 FPS, then silent mode, silent mode will work fine for those scenarios. But typically, silent mode uses around eight to 10 watts of power and it, it does help conserve battery life. Um, and in silent mode, you're probably looking at two to two and a half hours of gameplay, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on all the other settings you tweak, like Bluetooth being enabled, Wi-Fi being enabled, uh, things that are running in the background, because this is a Windows PC. Um, and of course, uh, the gameplay demand. But basically, this is not gonna really run less than around that eight to 10 watts when you're running a game. Performance mode, like I said, uh, when you're on battery, it's like 15 watts. When you're plugged in, it jumps up to about 20 watts. Turbo mode, 25 watts, up to about 30 watts when you're plugged in. And sometimes uh, it may even boost to higher um, wattages like 40 or 50 for periods of time, but usually not sustained. Uh, and then manual mode, we pop over here to manual mode. You can actually customize the sliders to be um, whatever wattage you're wanting. And the really cool thing to me is that you also have fan curves here. So you can set it, the device up to be as loud or as quiet as you want for the left and right fans. And of course, um, you can also set your power limits to be a little bit higher, up to 35 watts. Um, though typically I was seeing closer to uh, 25 to 30 watts most of the time in manual mode, maybe a burst uh, higher than that. But typically it was this 25 to 30 watt um, for the long power limits. When I'm plugged in, I typically was just running it in turbo mode because also the fans, uh, at least the way I have it set up right here, the fans uh, do get quite a bit louder and a bit more audibly noisy. In turbo mode, you usually don't hear the fans at all over any gameplay audio you're playing over the speakers. I do really, I, I have really enjoyed playing games on this, especially uh, the Witcher 3, I've probably played about five hours now directly on this device. Uh, and it is an awesome gaming experience for uh, a game like The Witcher 3. When you're in just normal laptop-ish mode, uh, it is possible to just control this with your finger, right? So as if it's a touch PC. So we're gonna start with Peter Spacey Roar. I'm gonna turn the volume all the way up. See how long it takes to change the volume? I just, I don't love how long it takes to change the volume. I wish this was faster. Like 10 increments of volume would be much better. Uh, Windows really needs to change that. Um, or at least make this do, make it go up and down by 10 so you could just quickly change the volume rather than only two. Ah, there it goes. Now, after you press it a bunch of times, it starts jumping by tens. <laughs>
So we peaked right around 82 decibels. We're definitely getting some nice bass, some decent mids and highs. It's, it is breaking up a bit. Like there's not perfect clarity on these speakers, but uh, I feel like for a mobile device, the speaker, that's, that's pretty impressive overall audio quality. Let's move into Faded Aeon Half-Life. <laughs> I I uh, like these speakers the mids and highs especially the highs tend to break apart but the overall volume is very loud um and there is significant left right audio separation as well when you're playing games so you do have spatial audio when the when the when the console uh, the handheld is facing you directly. Uh, you can tell if someone's coming from your left or right or or whatever. It's not it's not as good as headphones, but it's pretty close. Um, this is gonna be Deuce Williams. La la la. Love you. The vocals do sound really good, I think, and that definitely helps when you're listening to uh, like in-game dialogue audio. Um, that's what you want. You want to be able to have a good vocal experience where you can hear the game characters talking. Um, and then since there's a good amount of bass, like the cinematic music when you're playing games like The Witcher 3, really it does come through um, and give you a good audio experience. I could just launch The Witcher 3 real quick here and just let the intro kind of play. I see you gather before me. Hungry, terrified, clutching your babes to your breast. Emperor Emir has marched his legions into our lands, laid siege to every fortress from here to the Blue Mountains. Rabid and ravenous, he bites and bites away. Men of the North, you stand at the precipice. Your kings have failed you, so now you turn to the gods. And yet you do not plead. You do so... The uh, the audio, I think, on this device is immersive enough to where I don't feel like I need to go for headphones. For like long, good gaming sessions, I feel like the audio experience I'm getting just out of the box, sitting there on the couch, is awesome and uh, fully immersive. So uh, a couple of different uh, key gestures I also recommend learning. Three finger, you can, you can three finger swipe left and right to go between the most recent applications. As you can see, sometimes it doesn't really work very well. So there, I've got these two applications. I can should be able to three-finger swipe between the two of them. So if you've got Internet Explorer open or whatever, you can quickly jump between. That's cool, but it's not necessarily like, you know, mind-blowing or something. So, all right. So for our test here, I'm just going to pull up the real-time monitor so we can see uh, our basic CPU stats. And let's go ahead and run. So the important way to read this on the top up here is right now we're doing 27 watts through the APU, which is the CPU GPU combined. And then our overall wattage here at the bottom is our total system wattage use utilization. And I've noticed that this bottom wattage takes a little while to update. It does not immediately update. Uh, but notice right now we're getting 100% CPU utilization and we're hitting 3.6 gigahertz. Um, and I'm not sure if that's across all the cores or just one. And that's partially why I guess I want to open up HW info. Um, but that gives you an idea of the rough stats there. Right here, you can see that we're on a four nanometer with the Ryzen Z1 Extreme processor, which is uh, eight cores, 16 threads over here on the left. 
We've got LP DDR5 RAM, and we've got the Radeon GPU here. Um, I believe it's the 780M, if I'm if I understand correctly, as far as the integrated GPU, but it's a unified unit with, between the, the, the Z1 Extreme processor, which is based on a four nanometer architecture. You can see that right here. And the max TDP is 54 watts. Uh, though it doesn't sustain 54 watts because it gets too hot, even under max fans, 54 watts is a little bit much for the cooling system, um, which is kind of a bummer because 54 watts certainly does provide additional levels of performance. Overall, I feel like this system really is designed for higher than 720p gaming, like for real. It's very, it's very important to know. I, I think when you're looking at the Steam Deck, you're looking really at a 720p designed for gaming system. And when you're looking at the Ally, you're really looking at a 1080p gaming platform that'll be able to play games at 1080p the vast majority of the time at smooth frame rates. Not every time, but the vast majority of the time. All right, so let's go ahead and get uh, a run going here and we can take a look at our performance levels. We'll go ahead and start and we'll swap back. All right, so you can see that we are getting 3.6 gigahertz across all of the cores there. That's really great to see. You can see that we are doing uh, 80 degrees on the CPU and the CPU package power is right at 30 watts of power. And this is on battery mode. Right now we are not plugged in. And I'm curious if this would go up um, when we plug it in. I think it probably would go up, especially in a burst. Uh, I'm not sure how high it would go up to. I didn't test that. That's actually pretty interesting. So we got 12,962 for our first run. That is really impressive. Very, very impressive. Uh, let's do ahead and do another run. So that's super impressive, 13,104. Let's go ahead and try plugging in. See if we get any, in kind of, any kind of increased performance here. Plugged in 14,127. So right now you can see we are doing 95 degrees. We're also doing 41 watts of power right now. Okay, so we are boosting above the 30 watt limit. Um, just like I mentioned before, and we are basically thermal throttling right now. I don't know how long it's gonna be able to sustain this. Our overall clocks are doing 3.99 gigahertz, 3.87 gigahertz now. Um, did our power limit come down or are we just thermal throttling? So basically right now we're thermal throttling and we're getting down to 38 watts of juice. And this is where right now the turbo fans, I'll move the mic over here, you can kind of hear it. So that's right next to the fans. Um, the fans are barely audible, kind of like a quieter laptop mode right now um, in terms of fan noise. 13,807. If we go ahead and pop open Armory Crate and try entering manual mode where everything is maxed out, we'll pop over to manual mode. We'll hit apply. Can you hear the fans ramping up now? That is not that loud. So maximum fans putting out 47 decibels of audio, which, I mean, if it's a handheld and you're holding it right next to your face, you know, you're gonna hear that. Uh, but people across the room, for example, won't really hear that, um, at least not very loud or clearly. Cool, all right, let's try uh, manual mode and see what we get. Because the big thing here between turbo and manual mode is turbo definitely did not run fans at maximum speed. Whoa, right like now we're doing 4.3 gigahertz, 47 watts of power to the CPU, and our temps are climbing to 90. Pretty awesome to see this level of performance in such a little freaking handheld. It's kind of unbelievable, honestly. So now we're pulling down to 40 watts and doing 3.95 gigahertz, but still it's sustaining 40 watts now in manual mode, 14,338. So crazy cool. Like uh, my Legion 7i that I was using until a couple months ago, big beefy laptop pushing like a hundred and something watts through that CPU. It was doing 15,000 or approximately a little over 15,000. And this is so close to it. And that laptop two years ago cost $3,500.
Um, and it's a high performance laptop with a crazy cooling system and all of that. And now we've got this little handheld that's basically matching performance to that high performance system from two years ago. Okay, 14,432, I believe that's the best run we've had so far. Obviously insane, very awesome. And uh, if you were to use the AATU application, you might be able to undervolt and overclock this sucker a bit more for even more performance. Before we move into the full benchmarking segment, I want to just show you all the different settings in Armory Crate, um, how to adjust your audio settings and some of these other lighting things. So uh, we've already went through operating mode. That's how you change your performance mode. Uh, game visuals, this is where you can change your color scheme, basically your color schema. Um, let's go ahead and take off the real-time monitor. Um, so you have vivid, RTS, scenery, racing, cinema, FPS. I've just been using default. Uh, you can also adjust the color temperature if you wanna get rid of the blue light to be more um, like brownish or reddish. Under the lighting scenario, this is where you can change the key, uh, the, um, the little circle lighting around each of the knobs. So let's just go ahead and show you that. So under static, we can select the color. And of course we gotta turn the brightness up thing there coming through. Uh, so we've got blue knobs now, which look pretty cool. Uh, breathing, this will let you switch between two different colors. So we got blue and pink, purple right now. Strobing, color cycle, this will switch between a solid color, color going between a bunch of different colors. And then you have rainbow, which these, uh, these RGB lights, if you're gonna run this, I would run this on rainbow because it will blend the lighting between uh, multiple. The little RGB things are so bright that they're kind of blowing out the camera unless I really underexpose the camera. For example, when I was playing in a dark room, I tried turning this down to the, low, the lowest is 33%. It just was still so bright that it was kind of visually obnoxious to me um, when playing The Witcher 3. It looks great when you're in daylight or bright environments. I would love them but not a big fan of these RGB lights when you're actually playing games because the RGB is just like, like hitting your eyes and really it can be really distracting in a dark cave environment or something in The Witcher 3. That's my scenario in a dark room. It just was not fun. Anyway, and then Aura Sync lets you sync to your other Aura Sync devices if you have other ROG things that are compatible with Aura Sync. Under these settings, your, uh, your boot settings, uh, you can change whether the you can change whether the uh, awake sounds and lights come on. You know, some people don't want the uh, all of this stuff to animate and make a big deal because they want it to be, I don't know, more basic. You can turn those things off. Under connection, you have your Wi-Fi connection and as well as your Bluetooth. You can manage uh, your Bluetooth connected devices so you don't have to go to manage it through Windows if you don't want to. Under audio, you have your microphone modes. You have uh, different ways you can pick up your audio. I have not tested these. I don't know how well they work, but these are kind of your standard ROG things that they do in Armory Crate. Uh, speaker modes, you do have AI noise canceling based on the non-human sounds around you. I have not really tried this much, uh, though it's been off the whole time. So I haven't really, I have not really messed with this, haven't had time. Over here on the right is where you can adjust this window, this window that pops up when you press this button, the command center, you can take buttons. If you don't use some of these buttons, you can take some away or you can add new functionalities right here. Like if you want to be able to enable, disable your refresh rate, your resolution, your aura, LED brightness. I'm actually curious about the LED brightness. I like being able to turn it off and on on the fly. That's nice. So if you're in a dark environment, you can just turn them off now. So I really love the customizability of this software. Uh, it works well so far for me. It's crashed a few times, but generally it works well. Like I said, the other issue is just the overlays dealing with Windows and the controller software switching back to a mouse, back to a gamepad. Um, those are the other main issues I've had in general with the software. Okay, so. Um, okay, so here we are. We've got 46, 47 watts of power. You see that? 48 watts of power right now. Uh, 2600 on the core clock, which is really awesome. 2300 megabytes used for VRAM. Our CPU hitting 19% utilization, 18 FPS right here in TimeSpy. 
That is very good overall. Uh, much better than my initial test. My initial test on this, I think I was only getting like eight or nine FPS in like silent mode or something. And then I switched it to like performance mode and tried turbo mode. And this is so much better. This is more than double the initial first time I tested this. 20 FPS now. Very impressive. And look at our wattage. We're sustaining over 40 watts right now. And we're not thermal throttling either. 47, 48 watts. It is just, it's cranking. You know, like, like I'm, I'm seeing, like, like I said, I was seeing a lot of performance comparisons with the Steam Deck. And a lot of those people were comparing the performance of this against the Steam Deck when it's at 15 watts of power. And that may be a viable test when you're doing battery uh, life handheld gaming on the go, but you can do 30 watts of power to this. And then when you're plugged in, you can get over 40 watts of power uh, when you're plugged in is a night and day difference between a Steam Deck and this thing. Like this thing is absolutely so much more powerful than the Steam Deck when it's plugged in especially, or when it's at least at 30 watts, um, even when on battery. 2,829. 8,810 for CPU score. Overall, 3,149. That is crazy impressive, all right? For a handheld system, think of this as like a low entry level gaming laptop, essentially, that is just powerful enough to play most AAA games at 1080p, low to medium, sometimes high settings, smoothly. Manual mode, right? So. Let's do it ahead and do a silent mode. And let's do this on battery. All right, so we're gonna do a silent mode test on battery. So this is gonna give you the um, kind of performance you can get when you're basically trying to maximize the juice from the battery to make the, this little handheld last as long as possible. Um, and the simple fact is the performance is significantly reduced. Interesting. So right now we're still doing 30 watts of power. We should not be pulling that much wattage. Yeah, it's in. it did not stay in silent mode, um, but we are in silent mode now. And this is still gonna be um, very close at least. We, we ran in turbo mode for, for just a little bit at the beginning there, but notice that now we're in nine watts of power, all right? Seven FPS. We were doing 20 FPS when we were plugged in doing 40 watts of power that shows you literally the, the FPS drop you're talking about when you, when you rein in this chip, that's the, the Z one extreme that's in this, um, in the ally. Um, it really needs to really shine and get close to peak performance. I think it needs at least 25 Watts. 15 is kind of the minimum to like where you're getting most of the power, but like you want to get 80, 90% of the, Performance the chip can provide, you need 25 watts of power going through the, the system. Just keep in mind that at the very beginning, the test was running in turbo mode for about 10 seconds before we switched to silent mode. So not quite a perfect silent mode test, but that gives you a good idea of the level of performance. Much lower. 1333 for our graphic score, 3524. Huge difference. All right, so let's move into a, a performance mode test. We're doing 20 watts of juice right now, right? And we're doing 15 FPS, 18 FPS now, 17, okay? So in performance mode here, we're getting the majority of potential performance from the system. Uh, where silent mode, we really were not getting the majority. Like right here, we were getting like seven FPS. We're like doubling the amount of FPS by doubling our wattage. So if you're looking to maximize your battery life, when playing AAA games on the system, performance mode is probably the way to do it uh, and get the most battery life. And with performance mode enabled and you have your other settings kind of like dialed in well enough, like you're not, you're like limiting your FPS to at least 60, maybe even 45 FPS. Um, you could go down to 30 FPS as well because it's going to be smooth enough gameplay as long as the 1% lows are also right around 30. And if you, if, you, if you tune it correctly, I think you can get a little over two hours or about two hours of gameplay out of the system in performance mode. Now in turbo mode, which is the mode I used, for example, when I was at the gym, because at the gym, I knew I was going to be there for a little over an hour utilizing the ally in, you know, I'm sitting there on the elliptical playing The Witcher 3 
and I'm in turbo mode, you know, like I know that I'm not going to be there for two hours. I'm going to be there for a little over an hour and then I'm going to head home. So all I need is a little bit over an hour of juice out of the system anyway. So I just run it in turbo mode and it, and it lasted me um, about an hour and 40 minutes is what it was on track to last me. It was about one minute per 1% of the battery life. Okay, so there's performance mode. We got 2,406 for our graphics score, 6,154. Uh, so this is kind of the middle ground where you're getting the majority of performance from the system while conserving battery life. So performance mode is probably the way to go if you're trying to get that nice middle ground. And I think we're ready to go ahead and get into some testing here. Let's start out in Cyberpunk 2077. All right, so this is the Razer dock right here. It has um, a lot of different ports built into the Razer dock. So on the back, we have our power adapter that comes in. This has lots of juice. It does up to 100 watts of USB-C charging out through the cable to the device. The Ally only does 65 watts anyway. Now it has three USB-Cs out, and these are DisplayPort enabled. So we have this USB-C going to our monitor. We have this USB-C going to our Aerox 3 wireless gaming mouse. Uh, we have an Ethernet port, and we have three USB-As. We're, we're using only one of the USB-As for our keyboard. And then on the front, we also have a micro SD card slot and a headphone port. We've got all of this plugged in. This cable's going to our monitor, key, uh, mouse, keyboard. All right, and now we're set up right there on the monitor behind us. And our monitor settings is a screen mirroring, and they're both the monitors are set up at 1080p resolution. Now this monitor is 16 by 10, so it's stretching to be able to fit everything on here. If I wanna control this with keyboard and mouse, this is just like a PC now. So we're gonna utilize turbo mode for this testing here in Cyberpunk 2077. We are on a extremely lightweight handheld device playing Cyberpunk 2077. These are the settings that I got um, and they look, I think, Excellent. So I'll, I'll walk you through the settings, but I'm going to go just drive around a little bit just to give you an idea of the gameplay performance. Since the, the Ally has adaptive sync, that does help maintain smoother overall uh, visuals than these, this external monitor that does not have adaptive sync. Um, you get a little bit of screen tearing on this external monitor that you don't get when you're utilizing the, um, the Ally's display. We are in 1080p resolution right now, low, and then super resolutions on quality. Bump this up to say high, and then you could lower the FX super resolution, say down to performance. And let's go ahead and see what that looks like FPS wise. All right, so we're now on high settings in Cyberpunk 2077. High settings is insane. And we're still getting playable frame rates 40 FPS with 20 for our 1% lows right now. And so it just, it looks, it doesn't look as good on an external monitor. I much prefer to have quality for the FSR settings because this ends up being, everything looks a little bit smeared on the bigger display. Though on the little display, on the actual ally display, you don't really see the smearing so much. So I would actually be okay with running, oh, we ran into the wall there. Um, I would actually be okay with running everything on um, for like performance FSR if I'm using the handheld, but if I'm gonna be using an external display, I would tend to try to pre preserve the overall detail clarity a bit more. Let's just, let's just see how much performance we can get, setting everything to low, and let's say we're on ultra performance, right? So this is like, this is the most performance that you could realistically potentially pull from the system. Right now we're in the 60s to 70 FPS range, but the quality is way down, comparatively speaking. Like things are not as good on ultra performance mode. So I would, I would, I much prefer to keep FSR on quality or at least balanced. Here we are, we are in turbo mode. We're not in manual mode. We're not blasting maximum possible performance right now. We're just doing a turbo mode test. So this is the kind of performance you can get when you're on battery life um, as well in turbo mode and or very similar levels of performance. 45 FPS right now in the middle of this test, 28 for our 1% lows, very smooth gameplay, right? It's, it's 
it's going to feel fluid. It's going to feel good um, when you're playing, especially if you're doing it handheld. 46 FPS, 16.6 for the 1% lows there, but our 1% lows through Afterburner were much better than that. That was the, That's the min FPS is 16.6. So right now in The Witcher 3, we are doing 85 FPS. I was testing this on the Steam Deck, so I think we had the low, we have lower resolution settings right now. We're gonna do high settings. We're gonna do FSR on quality. Let's do 1080p. This is 1080p high settings, right? This is not low settings, this is high settings. So that means enhanced lighting and shadows. 39 FPS is gonna be extremely playable, especially when you're dealing with a handheld. I would probably wanna boost this closer to 60 FPS. So I believe when I was running this, I was probably doing FSR on probably balanced or performance mode. Let's try balanced. 45, I think that I would probably target 45 FPS. Battery mode, it's now doing 25 watts, right? See that? 25 watts instead of 30. When we were plugged in, so we dropped five watts. But if we plug in our ASUS official adapter cable, you'll see the performance can be at least significant. Notice that it's showing turbo with the 30 watt. Let's set it to manual watt. Look at that, we're doing 45 watts now that we've got the ASUS power adapter plugged in. So if you're looking to maximize your performance on the Ally, you're gonna need to use uh, I, whatever, whatever power adapter or power supply that's going to actually supply the full juice because look at us, we're doing 50 FPS now. You'll notice that our temperatures are also very spicy at 93 degrees. Right around 40 watts is kind of what this thing can sustain in the long haul. Very smooth, great to play. Like it, it feels really, really smooth. So 45 average FPS, 31 for our 1% lows, which is really good. I'm gonna go ahead and switch back to the Thunderbolt dock. Interesting. It's actually maintaining the 43 watts right now through the Thunderbolt port, so that's good. It's showing that we're in turbo mode, but it's still giving us the 43 watts. Even though we're on the Thunderbolt dock, well, now it's going down to 30. Okay, so sometimes I guess this thing takes a little while to update. If we go to manual right now, it's saying if it's 15 watts. Let's see what we get in actuality on manual mode when we're plugged in. So this is performance mode now. It's 20 watts. Interesting, the lighting is changing a lot. But right now at 20 watts of power to the, the system, we're doing 38, 39 FPS. So when we're doing 40 watts, we're doing closer to 50 FPS. When we're doing um, 20 watts, we're doing 39 FPS. So it's still playable at 1080p. And of course, if you're wanting to play the game on higher FPS, you can go to low settings, of course. And you know, The Witcher 3 does not look bad on low settings, right? It looks pretty dang good on low settings. And right now, even though we're only doing 20 watts, we're still getting 50 FPS in The Witcher 3. All right, so turbo mode, it's pushing 50 watts through the CPU now. Resetting it, now we're getting 60 FPS here at 1080p FSR on balanced mode. 56 on average, 55, 43 for a 1% low. This is so much better than what the Steam Deck can do. Like the Steam Deck would just, it would not be able to handle this level of uh, graphics and performance, especially at 1080p high settings. It would just, it just, it was gonna get a lot more chuggy. Right now we're at 1080p resolution. I believe we're on low graphics settings. FSR is set to balanced, which is, you know, if you're in doing handheld mode, you could probably set this down to performance or even ultra performance. Probably performance is probably the lowest you'd wanna go. But look at us doing 71 FPS here in The Witcher, 1080p. If we do um, you know, an external monitor, then you know I would probably say you probably want to do quality or maybe balanced, you know, because it's going to be sharper image, um, especially at 1080p. And and the gameplay is still going to be good. Look at us, we're still doing 58 FPS right now. And notice that there has not been very much stuttering or 1% low stutters. A lot of a lot of PCs have a lot of stuttering in The Witcher 3, and we're really not seeing much stuttering, which is awesome to see, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and start uh, this run. So again, 1080p, we're doing 30 watts of power through the system. We're on, I believe we're on low settings right now.
with FSR on quality right now. And um, yeah, very playable, 55 FPS right now, 38 for a 1% lows. It's a great 1080p gaming experience, at least in The Witcher 3. Um, and once we get over here, I'll also reset us uh, to high settings so you can kind of see what the FPS looks like when you're on high, or maybe even ultra. I'll just go ahead and go through each setting. So we've got 5840 for our, our test there. Let's go to uh, graphics. We'll, we'll try ultra settings. FSR, we'll put to, um, I will leave it on. We'll leave it on quality just so you can see how this affects everything. All right, so. So this is ultra settings, 1080p. Give it a second to kind of load, finish loading in. The gameplay is definitely not as smooth now, especially on the external monitor because it does not have adaptive sync. The gameplay looks better on the handheld itself because it does have adaptive sync. So 38 FPS, 29 for our 1% lows. This is still very playable and looks very good even on 1080p ultra settings, okay? Um, Totally usable. Honestly, I would consider maybe playing it at that setting, especially if you got it plugged in, because if you have it plugged in with the ASUS power adapter, you can push it up to like, like I said, 40 something watts. It's gonna jump up to a little bit higher FPS. If we go to our graphics settings, you know, you could also lower FSR to be, make it higher FPS. Let's go to high settings. All right, and now on high settings, we're doing 49 FPS. This feels smoother to me. This is the settings that I've been playing The Witcher 3 on um, with the handheld. Because uh, I think it looks basically just as good. 1080p quality FSR on high settings. And it is a great gaming experience where you can fight well. You can respond to enemies that are come at you. Dead Space Remake, we're at 1080p, 120Hz for the refresh rate. FX super resolution. We have it set to ultra performance with low graphics quality right now. Uh, let's try quality and see how it goes. Now that we're in turbo mode, we're getting 40 f uh, 40 watts of power now to the to the GPU, and our FPS is in the playable range. All right, it was not in the playable range when we were in performance mode. You have to be in turbo mode in order for this game to really be playable at 1080p. Let's see what we get in just performance mode here. You know, the game still looks pretty dang good. Um, and now we're getting, we're at least in the 35 FPS range. We are getting some 1% low stutters that are bringing our, you know, it's bringing it down to eight. Notice that we are thermal throttling at 95 degrees Celsius. Dead space, again, bringing the Ryzen CPU to its knees, thermally speaking. The game looks good on my display right now. Like, I, I could play this game at 1080p on a larger TV and not be like hating the quality. Like the image quality still looks pretty good. This is a scenario where you may need to drop it. If you wanna have really smooth gameplay, you might need to drop this down to 720p. So for our, our FSR, we're gonna do quality. Since we're doing quality FSR, it's not much of a difference visually or, I, don't know, I think visually it actually looks better at 1080p with FSR. Um, then it does going down to 720p and doing quality for FSR. If we're just, let's just say for the sake of argument, we're just trying to see what kind of FPS we can get when we lower the settings all the way down. So 55 right now, if you're like optimizing for maximum FPS on the console, um, if you're like, you're like, oh, I really want just a smooth gaming experience. I don't care if it looks a little bit blurry or the image quality goes down a little bit. It's interesting that when you look this direction, the FPS goes down so much more compared to looking the other way. Like we were getting 60 something looking the other direction, but. So the way I would optimize this game, I would do 1080p and then I would choose uh, ultra performance or maybe performance probably. Yeah, I would probably, honestly, I would probably set it to um, performance. I think ultra performance is probably a little bit too fuzzy. So visually right now we're at 1080p resolution Everything is set to low. FX are set to ultra performance. Uh, look at the visual qualities. You know, FSR 2 on ultra performance is very low resolution. You can definitely see the images, especially if you pause the stream and look at it. It's, it's very, um, you lose a lot of detail.
around the character here, especially during fast movement. If we're gonna use the actual display here, everything is so much smaller. It doesn't seem as noticeable, the little glitchiness when you're holding it on the handheld. Uh, I could probably play with FSR and Ultra Performance uh, in, a, in, a, in a squeeze and not really be that disturbed by, by it. But when, on, when it's on an external monitor that everything's blown up, you really notice those artifacts way more. All right, so now we're on performance. So this is gonna increase our resolution quite a bit. All right, but notice that our character detail around the, uh, the back here and his, like it look, actually looks like good detail now on the character itself. Um, and we're still doing 35, thir uh, 22 FPS. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be, I think, in the playable range still. In summary, I would say that this game is still very playable, but it's definitely the harder to run in the harder to run category for the uh, Asus Ally. If you can run this with the higher 40 watt um, power adapter going to the Ally, just with the straight Asus power adapter going in, it's gonna be uh, like five FPS higher probably in terms of performance. And that 1% low is gonna be a little higher, making the gameplay feel quite a bit smoother as well. We're gonna plug in the Asus power adapter. I love that I can just switch this on the fly. So now we're going from 25 up to the 40. The gameplay on this, like it feels good because we have adaptive sync. Like if you've played 30 FPS on a, on a screen without adaptive sync, it does not feel very good because all the screen tearing and everything. It's still, the gameplay actually still feels pretty good um, to where if you know, like the switch is only 30 FPS and a big part of that is because of how smooth everything is and how it's consistent FPS just lends itself to a nice smooth gaming experience where you don't have very many stutters or 1% lows. And as long as the 1% lows are staying above around 24 FPS, it's gonna be a smooth gaming experience all around. And right now that's just basically right in line with where we're getting just a hair under um, 21, just a hair under 24 FPS for our 1% lows, 40 for our, our main average. And this is with performance mode. You could get a little higher FPS if you wanted to. Um, so, okay, so 1080p FSR on performance mode with low settings, 51 FPS right now. Very nice overall. Of course, our 1% lows are gonna be messed up between the loading screens. This is clearly like a good gaming experience in terms of overall average FPS at 44. I'll show you a little bit more gameplay examples when we hook it up to the widescreen monitor. This is one of the games we're gonna use on the widescreen monitor to test. The thing is, even if we were to lower our resolution down to 720p, even though 1080p is like a massive increase to overall resolution, um, total number of pixels being rendered, you would not have double the FPS going down to 720p because this game is gonna be um, a bit CPU bound. So we averaged 50 FPS here. Okay, so there's our flashlight. All right, so um, right now we're getting 70 FPS in this scene, which is kind of interesting that our FPS is so much higher. A bit of a stutter there. We'll just try to get into a bit of a fight here. As you can see, we're getting really good FPS on these settings. And the game is very playable. Our 1% low is at 45, which is just really, really good. 1080p resolution. FSR is set to balanced. So everything is set to low settings right now. During the intro sequence, so far we're doing 50 FPS. 40 FPS for our 1% low at 1080p, and low settings look pretty good. If you were comparing this side by side with a high-end gaming PC visually, you might be able to see a difference in maybe in the texture quality and certain other special effects, but this looks crisp. Right now, 50 FPS, 41 for our 1% low, is incredibly excellent. Last of Us, 1080p low settings, FSR on balanced mode. We have good 1% lows above 24. We're getting 40 FPS right now, but 46 FPS so far running around in these hallways. Uh, we really wanna try to get to a little bit more air, open area. 
I'm just gonna open up on these guys. Oh man. This combat in this game is just so visceral, it's crazy. So that gives you an idea, 44 FPS, 26 for a 1% low, 1080p low settings in Last of Us. Very playable, but if you're after just a good visual experience, good enough, this checks that box, in my opinion, in Last of Us. So we're doing 120 hertz, 1080p resolution. We are set to minimum FSR on quality. 720p Witcher on low settings does not look as good as 1080p on high settings. It really is a massive difference in terms of... We're having some big load-in stutters right now on Warzone. We're being shot by someone. I'm guessing that the stutters right there in Warzone are probably related to loading in the map. Like we're just spawning into a new area, loading in the map, and it's probably the, the reason why. 45 FPS, 31 for a 1% low. That's obviously gonna be, you know, that's obviously gonna be playable. Oh! <laughs> I um, did not deploy the parachute in time. <laughs> what is this? Warzone glitched out on me and didn't even load in. The, con the fact that I can't use keyboard and mouse and have a controller plugged in at the same time, that feels weird to me. Um, but that's probably more on the developers of Warzone. They haven't optimized yet for the ROG Ally, I guess. You know, like I feel like uh, you should be able to actively switch between the, the ROG Ally and the uh, controller setup and a keyboard and mouse on the fly if both are plugged in. 1080p FSR on quality in Warzone. 50 FPS, our 1% low at 16 is obviously not perfect. It did bounce up to 27 for a little bit, down to five. In general, it's feeling pretty smooth, except certain like occasional just like stutters. And obviously you don't want stutters if you're trying to play a competitive FPS. Though it's it doesn't seem to be stuttering except for certain odd moments, you know? Okay, yeah, the gulag is working properly now. I'm gonna reset our FPS count for this area of the map and see how we're doing for our 1% lows. There's our buddy in there about to fight somebody. 57, 36 overall inside a war zone. Again, without everything being super optimized. That's usually how I end up testing war zone. A good overall experience, but not like ideal for a competitive shooter. 150, 170. 200 FPS right now in CSGO with a mobile handheld. What? Um, absolutely insane. 207, 194. Obviously, this is without as much stuff, kind of easier to run environment here. Uh, as we get to more stuff on the screen, it's gonna go down right now, 118, 120. Inside the smoke now, getting down to 30 FPS. But still, 30 FPS inside the smoke is not bad. You could still at least see what's going on. It's not like a sh it's not like a slideshow. Like I remember playing CS:GO, and I would go through the smoke, and it would be like five to 10 FPS uh, back on the older PCs. And the fact that this can still maintain 30 FPS even when going through the smoke is awesome. That is actually pretty. That's pretty great. 156.7. So 157 for our uh, CS:GO. FPS at 1080p resolution. I think we could probably even bump this up to QHD resolution and still have a great gaming experience. We have so many people here. Let's try running back this way. So doing about 120 FPS right now. We got a kill! Uh, I gotta say this is playing so smooth and very responsive. I definitely feel like you could play competitive esports on this um, and not feel like you're missing out horribly. Like, obviously CSGO is an excellent 240 hertz FPS type of a game. 
But yeah, like right there, like I feel like I have perfect aim control. It's responsive. Um, great gaming experience. Right now we're at 720p. Everything is set to low, but we do have um, TSAA enabled. So things do look a little bit sharper than they would. So everything is loading in. All the textures and stuff are loading in right now. It's definitely stuttering a lot right now. Like this makes me want to come in here and lower our textures down to, to two gigs or something. I don't know. That's actually showing, I think that's showing latency. That's showing internet connection issues. I don't think that's related to our, um, like I think our FPS is actually good. If I go down here and text texture streaming budget to nothing, is that gonna help us out? Oh yeah, that helped us out. So it was the textures. It was the textures absolutely that was messing everything up. So textures set to lowest settings. Now we're good to go. Everything is smooth. Well, it was smooth. Now it's not smooth. Interesting. Yeah, things are not smooth right now. It's better than it was, but this is, this is interesting. Yeah, this is, these are connection legs as well. So, is something being downloaded in the background or something? Let me see. All tabbing out, all tabbing back in. And now look at us. 117 FPS, 89 FPS for our 1% lows. This is a great gaming experience. Let's try going to 1080p so you can see what that's like. 80 FPS, 65. This is good. This is not as good though, right? Like this is smooth. I could play like this and not feel like it's awful at 1080p, but I definitely would prefer the 120 FPS because that, that makes a big difference. That's a 50% increase to smoothness. Hogwarts Legacy, one of the hardest to run games. We're not gonna cap our frame rate. FSR on quality, 1080p. Everything is set to low with no ray tracing enabled. Let's see what we get. Okay, so uh, every time you log into Hogsmeade, it's always stuttery on every computer that I've ever been in. So pretty much except for like one or two. So let's just run through the system real quick here. Right now, 43, 44 FPS. Let's go ahead and run down the, the hallway here. 20 FPS for our 1% low is really good. Um, we've had no major stutters since we've started, since we've ran back, forward and back once. 42 FPS on average. 20 for our 1% lows, phenomenal. Okay, that is phenomenal overall. Uh, smoothness and gameplay performance. Like this is a good enough gameplay experience. You're gonna have the, you're gonna have stutters in Hogwarts no matter what, just because of the way they designed the game. Um, when you're loading in areas with new textures and stuff, our one percent low fourteen is is it's not gonna be that stuttery normally, because um, once you get everything loaded in in an area, it'll the one percent low will come up. Ten eighty p seven twenty p resolution, no VSync, no triple buffering. FSR is set to quality. Graphics mode is set to low right now. Here we go, 40 FPS, 32 for our 1% low. The game is looking good. It's not like incredibly crisp, but it's definitely crisp enough. You could play on a TV. You could. Uh, it would look good overall in terms of an enjoyable gameplay experience. And that's from like a big screen gaming experience. It's gonna look good. If you play this on the handheld, right? Everything is smaller on this little screen. The details just look awesome on the little screen. Like, like when you blow it up on a big screen, you notice the little differences with FSR enabled and the little artifacts. On the little screen, it looks perfect. It looks really, really good. Let's try changing our settings. Let's just see what happens when we go to ultra. I don't think it's going to I don't think it's gonna play that well on Ultra, but I haven't tried it. Maybe it will, maybe it'll play all right. Yeah, Ultra settings appear to be a bit too much for the system to handle. Getting around 16 FPS on average. Um, let's try, let's try original. So this is, I guess, what, how the game was originally designed to be ran. Wow, okay, so original is actually, appears to be pretty playable at 30. For God of War, given the fact that it's an action title, and I'm sure some areas of the game are gonna run a little bit 
a little bit choppier than this area of the map. I would probably want to run it on low settings. This display output is actually capable of running this at, at least in theory, at the 5120 by 1440p resolution. So this is the native display resolution of this monitor, 5120 by 1440p, which is absolutely insane. And I'm not, I don't, I don't think that this little guy is gonna be able to run almost anything at 5120 by 1440p, maybe CSGO, but at 3840 by 1440p, um, there are widescreen monitors that have this exact resolution that are basically identical to the one I have here with me. I used to own one um, that was 3840 by 1080p. So this is a very realistic test for the monitors that have this widescreen resolution. So let's go ahead and just do a couple of tests. We can change this to 240 Hertz, 3840 by 1080p 240 is our display resolution right now. Right now we're getting 100 FPS in ultra wide. What? It is insane. Isn't that insane? If you were to tell me that this would be able to play ultra wide gaming at all, at any, any game at this resolution, over 100 FPS, I would say you're crazy. And yet, look at it, it's doing 120, 90. It's like consistently not stuttering, it's smooth for our overall, the overall gameplay experience is excellent right now. Got another one, triple kill. Um, how awesome is that? I got the MVP too, that round. Okay, so there's CSGO. Uh, we're averaging in the 90 to 110 range, I think, most of the time here. I'd have to actually watch it back to see for sure, but that is really impressive to me that it can play it at all. All right, so low quality, 3840 by 1080. Let's see, let's see how it plays. In the same environment that we were running 1080p, um, earlier. So we're actually getting 41 FPS. Like this is definitely playable. Like we are getting some stutters. But I think once everything is loaded in, I think it'll be smooth. 35 FPS is obviously very playable. I'm not saying that people should buy the Ally and then buy this really expensive monitor that costs more than the Ally to be able to play it, but you could get you could buy a um, like a widescreen, wide aspect ratio, 1080p monitor, and you could still play games. Right now, ultra widescreen gaming, Witcher 3 on low settings, low settings, FSR on performance, 3840 by 1080p, and we are, we are right now averaging 38 FPS. Like this is far from the ideal gaming experience at this widescreen resolution. But to me, just the fact that you could play this at all is insane. And it's definitely playable. We're above 24 FPS for our 1% lows at 36 FPS. Let's try switching it to uh, turbo. Maybe that'll bump us up to a higher wattage. Okay, so now we're at higher wattage. Oh, sorry guys. Now we're doing, we're doing 40 FPS there. This is you know, gonna be a bit more demanding moving through the, the game world very quickly. It's still smooth. 35 FPS, 26 for a 1% low. Like this makes me wonder how many other AAA games could you actually run? All right, 3840 by 1080, low, we'll try performance. Whoa, are you serious? It's doing 45 FPS? You've got to be kidding me right now. 42, our 1% low is 21. This is definitely in the playable category. <laughs> On an ultra widescreen monitor, I mean, obviously we're, we're upscaling quite a lot here with FSR, but if you're from a distance or if you had a little bit smaller monitor, like this is a really big monitor, really blowing up the pixels. So you really see the pixel pixelation. So 39 FPS on average in this ultra widescreen monitor experience. Again, I'm just blown away that this can do this at all. And this is the kind of thing where I'm saying like the ally, the ally just stretches its legs so much further than a steam deck. A steam deck I bet would get less than 20 FPS in this scenario, completely unplayable even remotely. 
And this is this is actually very playable. It's very playable, especially since the 1% lows are actually pretty good. You can see we're at 13, 38.40 by 10.80. Ray tracing is off. Quality settings are on low. Advanced settings, everything is set to low. I don't know why it's not uh, giving us the full render resolution. Let's try 25.60 by 10.80. Whoa, okay. I don't know if we're gonna be able to, maybe, maybe Elden Ring's not compatible with widescreen. Let's just set it back to the wide resolution so everything's not stretched. And let's try uh, high settings. All right, let's just see what happens when we go high settings. All right, so Elden Ring on high settings, 1080p, 31 FPS, 30 FPS. We're getting some 1% low stutters that are on the low side for sure. But yeah, just know that it's like above 30 FPS, around 20 for our 1% lows. I got a hit in, got two hits in, three, four, five hits in, six hits in. Oh man, we're about to get wiped now. So that gives you an idea, like around 40 FPS on low settings, 30 FPS on high settings at 1080p. So Elden Ring, very playable. This little beast is definitely capable of doing some ultra widescreen 3840 by 1080p gaming above 30 fps it's not like the premium gaming experience of a high-end gaming laptop or whatever but if you have a moderately higher resolution like qhd uh, resolution because this is more than qhd resolution at 3840 by 1080 right so if you have a qhd external monitor know that in many of the games you are going to get playable frame rates at qhd or preferably really i think most games are going to play better and you're going to be able to turn the settings up a little bit higher if you go to medium FPS or, or, or medium settings in general with FSR on quality, maybe on lower, like certain games, like newer games, like uh, Jedi Survivor, obviously that's a very demanding game and we're barely eking out um, playable FPS on the lowest settings. AAA titles like Witcher 3, Cyberpunk 2077, they're a little bit older, older. You can get 60 FPS gaming at 1080p if you're willing to play with FSR, lower the right settings at the right ways. Uh, overall, the battery life on this, as I mentioned earlier, about two hours in silent mode, a little over two hours maybe in silent mode, but you're not gonna be able to really do AAA gaming on that. On performance mode, you're gonna get uh, reduced FPS performance, only about 75% of the potential performance of the machine. And you're gonna be able to get, um, you know, like about two hours, a little, little under two hours, like an hour and 40 to two hours of performance. In turbo mode, I was getting a little bit less than an hour and 40 minutes, um, down to maybe an hour and 20 minutes, depending on your settings. Uh, so battery life on this can be pretty limited, all right? So that's probably the biggest downside to the Ally if you're after something that is gonna be like, you know you're gonna commute uh, for three, four hours, you're gonna need three or four hours of gameplay, um, on the handheld device, then you need to bring a battery pack or you need to consider getting a Steam Deck instead. Even though it has lower resolution and a, and a low, lower power um, graphics card in the Steam Deck, the Steam Deck battery is much more optimized for performance on those like long battery runs. That said, even the Steam Deck, when you're running maximum settings, it's only gonna be a little bit longer than this. You know, a little over two hours if you're trying to do the, the 15 watts higher performance gaming um, in AAA games at the lower resolution. The biggest thing about the Ally is that higher resolutions at 1080p, QHD, or this ultra wide gaming form factor are possible with proper um, gameplay settings and, and everything uh, to where the game is playable on these higher resolutions, which can be a much more awesome experience than a little display, right? Now, the other thing about the Ally is that you can get the XG Mobile uh, attachment to it. And I talked about this in detail at the beginning, went through examples, showed you where you can buy it um, on Best Buy's site. There are other places you can buy it. You can buy used ones as well on eBay. The XG Mobile will turn this thing into a monster mid-range to high-end gaming PC that will be able to play on ultra settings or high settings uh, for this like widescreen monitor or QHD gaming. And you're gonna be able to just breeze right through most of the games on the ultra and high end settings. So if you're after like a more premium gaming experience when you're at home docked, 
then you can get this plus, plus the XG Mobile and have a great all around experience. Now, Cinebench R23, we were getting uh, around 12 to 13,000 on the lower performance mode. Higher performance mode, we were getting 14.4 thousand in Cinebench R23 without any additional tweaks and optimizations, which is insane for a little mobile handheld. That's more than a lot of gaming laptops can get in CPU only benchmarks, which it's so it's phenomenal. I really was very impressed with the CPU performance in here. If you're after just a powerful general PC that you can use, um, around town, you can just dock it and you can do your email, you can watch Netflix on it, you can do whatever you want when you unplug it, and you can do whatever you want when you plug it into an external monitor like this, and just use it like a PC, this will work as a whole PC for your family or whatever. Like, it's it's a whole PC in your hand. Um, and it's full Windows 11. And that's, uh, that is a huge plus, and it is a huge con. Because it's full Windows 11, that means you have drivers and software compatibility issues that happen frequently. And because you have Windows 11 here, you're also dealing with uh, the battery optimization and battery life issues, like where the Steam Deck being on um, its own Linux, Steam OS, that is designed for maximum battery optimization, quick loading in and out of games, and it's just purely designed for gaming. This can replace your whole PC, a Steam Deck Theoretically can, but not without a lot of extra work and a lot of extra optimization and, and, and much more than even this. Ergonomically, I enjoyed gaming on this. The speakers on this do provide spatial audio, left-right audio separation. I love it. I, I've really enjoyed my time playing The Witcher 3 on here. That's in the main game I played over the last few days, uh, over six hours of gameplay directly on here. And it feels like I'm getting the premium gameplay experience the way the game is meant to be played. When I loaded The Witcher 3 up on the Steam Deck, it's just lower resolution and not as high of FPS and just doesn't feel like I'm getting the premium gaming experience of the AAA title the way the developer meant for it to be played. But I feel like I'm getting that with this. And it's not like, if, if you run the Ally and the Steam Deck at the same resolution, 720p resolution, and you do benchmarks, the Ally's not gonna be that much faster, especially if you restrict the wattage on the Ally to be a lot lower because a lot of these games are CPU bound. But when you play at higher resolutions like we just did, the Ally, I believe, would have more than double the FPS performance of the Steam Deck in those types of docked scenarios or just straight trying to hit 1080p FPS benchmarks or gameplay performance on higher settings, right? The Steam Deck, you try to run high settings on The Witcher 3 or, or whatever, even at the lower resolution, sometimes it just chugs. And it's, it's far less likely that whatever game you want to play in the future is gonna chug on the Ally than the Steam Deck. So if you're after a gameplay experience that feels the way the developers meant for the game to be played, most of the time, you're gonna get that experience way more often on the Ally than on the Steam Deck. But you still get that experience on the Steam Deck often enough, and if you are home, and you do have good internet, you can do PC streaming through cloud streaming services like Xbox Game Pass, GeForce Now, and you can use external TVs, even do 4K gaming on either of these devices with ultra settings and everything through those cloud streaming services. So there are, there are options on both to be able to push the FPS and push the resolution to higher levels um, for those ultra levels of gaming performance if you wanna go the cloud streaming route as well. So I just wanted to point that out, um, make sure I included that in here. I did do some cloud gaming experiences with the yoga book live stream that I did uh, earlier in the week or like at the end of last week. I would encourage you to check that out if you're curious about the cloud streaming because I don't have time to cover that in today's um, video, but I did do some cloud streaming on this with Halo Infinity and it felt excellent. Like it felt very low latency and very high levels of graphics. And when you do cloud gaming, in addition, the, uh, the battery usage on the device itself is very low. So your battery life, if you're gaming around the house unplugged, is gonna be very smooth and very high graphical uh, levels at the same time that your um, you're not killing the battery very quickly. So you can get two and a half to three hours probably of cloud gaming around the house without charging. So that's also very, very good. Should you buy this? If you're after a handheld gaming experience 
and it's between this and the Steam Deck, I would buy this every single time because you're not locked into the Steam OS in the same way. This has much higher performance for higher levels of graphical settings. You get a much more powerful CPU, a next generation CPU. The only reason you'd buy the Steam Deck over this is if you really love indie games that are easy to run and you want longer battery life on those games. Because this thing just can't go to as low of wattage as the Steam Deck for those long-term battery runs. But other than that, just get an external battery pack that you can take with you if you wanna extend the battery life of this or the Steam Deck really, because either way, you're probably gonna want more than two hours of gameplay if you're gonna be going for a long trip anyway. So how does this stack up against a gaming laptop? If you're talking about a budget entry level, like $800 gaming laptop versus this, I would buy this honestly over a gaming laptop that's 800 bucks, all right? Just this is, this is going to provide almost as good of a gaming experience as an $800 gaming laptop, but this will be portable. This is meant for gaming. This is going to have better speakers. It's going to have uh, enough RAM. It's going to have 120 hertz high quality display. This is just going to be a better overall buy at the $800 mark against most other $800 gaming laptops. There might be a few exceptions out there, like if an Acer Natural 5 with everything, all the bells and whistles is out there and ha has 16 gigs of RAM and all that already pre-built in, then maybe that would be a competitor to this. But most $800 gaming laptops are gonna be worse than this or maybe a little bit better in performance, but worse in other ways, right? And then it's not gonna have the versatility this is gonna have and all that. But now when you compare this, say against a $1,500 mid-range gaming notebook, that's where it gets really tricky because the $1,500 RTX 3070 Ti or RTX 4070, that thing is going to play much higher FPSs and at much higher resolutions and at much higher settings all at the same time and it's gonna provide a whole nother premium tier of gaming experience above this. And the only way this thing can compete with that mid-range laptop is by getting the XG Mobile external GPU and plugging it in. And then you're gonna only get that level of experience when you take the XG Mobile with you. So yeah, and the XG Mobile experience is really primarily all about docking it at home at a monitor with a keyboard and mouse in my opinion. Can I recommend the RG Alley? Absolutely. Should you? abandon your gaming laptop and just buy this. Only I would say if you're in the market for another really low level budget um, gaming laptop. Otherwise, I mean, in some ways you could buy this in like an ultra book that's not really meant for gaming. So you have like two devices. Um, alternatively, you can get the XG Mobile or you can just get a more expensive gaming laptop. And the main advantage I think with the going with the gaming laptop as well, if you buy a 15, 16, 17 inch gaming laptop or even a 14 inch, the display size on a gaming laptop provides for an entirely different level of immersion and detail of the images that you're looking at. So um, constantly when I was playing The Witcher 3, I was noticing that I had to pull this closer to my face to read quest text or to read the subtitles or whatever, or just see the details of the game that I'm playing. And so I tend to want to hold this closer to get the same visual experience of a laptop that's further away from me. I still much prefer playing on my Blade 18 or on my desktop with the giant monitor compared to playing on this. But I gotta say that in terms of overall gaming experience, this is not far behind. And for $800, it provides an excellent value for gamers looking for an overall platform that also say they want a, a PC, they get this plus maybe a USB-C dock. And for like 850 bucks, they got themselves a PC, that they can hook up to their monitor, keyboard and mouse and do significant awesome gaming at 1080p resolution with an external monitor or even higher resolutions as we show, as I showed you in today's live stream. There's my review of the ROG Ally. I did buy this with my own money. I hope you guys enjoyed this live stream. If you did, slam that like button and if you wanna help support me, use the links in the description. If you buy any accessories or thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Brandon.